I'm really pleased to be able to talk to all of you today on uh, this particular topic, um, mostly because of uh, what the City Club itself stands for. I spoke here in 2008 when I was part of a global event called the Gathering of One, and City Club played an instrumental role in bringing uh, uh, Native American elders on board which uh, made, really made uh, the gathering of one a true global event. And so I've, I've had a fondness for the City Club ever since then. So today we're going to have a lot of fun going in a whole different direction in uh, a topic that is becoming more and uh, more germane as uh, technology and uh, quantum mechanics starts uh, making greater and greater inroads. So um, I'm going to start out just by creating definitions of terms. <clears throat> now, I'm sure almost nobody has heard of Singularity University. And uh, the statement on the right, it comes directly from their website. What is Singularity University? Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower leaders to apply exponential technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. Now that sounds rather uh, wonderful and inviting. However, um, what people may not know is the greater implication of what Singularity University stands for. Um, I myself, besides being a best-selling author um, and a mathematician, uh, I also worked at NSA, at the National Security Agency, and left for very good reasons. So what most of you may not know is NSA is very much invested in this term which is called singularitarianism. Now it's not as esoteric as it may sound, so I'm going to, in case you can't read this, I'm going to go ahead and read what the, the mission statement and the definition of singularitarianism is. It's a movement defined by the belief that a technological singularity, and I really want to highlight that, the creation of super intelligence, will likely happen in the medium future, and that deliberate action ought to be taken to ensure that the singularity benefits humans. Singularitarians are distinguished from other futurists who speculate on the technological singularity by their belief that the singularity is not only possible, but desirable if guided prudently. Accordingly, they might sometimes dedicate their lives to acting in ways they believe will contribute to its rapid yet safe realization. Time Magazine describes the worldview of singularitarians by saying that, quote, they think in terms of deep time, they believe in the power of technology to shape history, they have little interest in the conventional wisdom about anything, and they cannot believe you're walking around, living your life, and watching TV as if the artificial intelligence revolution were not about to erupt and change absolute everything, unquote. So I'm going to let that just set in for a few seconds. I did a talk at the Society for Scientific Exploration on this whole notion about artificial intelligence and its role or non-role. I'm not going to go into great depth on it other than to highlight a few of the points that was brought up at that lecture. <clears throat> One of those was uh, this headline banner which went across the entire internet not more than three months ago in which Stephen Hawking stated, and I quote, One can imagine such technology outsmarting financial markets, out-inventing human researchers, out-manipulating human leaders, and developing weapons we cannot even understand. Whereas the short-term impact of AI depends on who controls it, please keep that phrase in mind, 
The long-term impact depends on whether it can be controlled at all. End quote. Now, at SSE, I countermanded Stephen Hawking's premises quite at length based on mathematics, which is my field of expertise. And I submitted that Stephen Hawking was speaking outside of his field of expertise and went into great length as to why AI isn't even going to come close to the human condition. And here's why. One of the big arguments in uh, neuroscience is they can't even agree on a definition of what is intelligence. Seriously. They have yet to come up with a definition that they will all agree on. Secondly, they have failed to bring in the notion of consciousness. And much to their chagrin, others have. And I'm going to quote from Google's Kurzweil in this matter. In an article he wrote for Time Magazine, George Kurzweil, one of the leading experts in AI, says that even though most of the people in the field think we're still several decades away from creating a human level intelligence, he puts the date at 2029, less than 15 years away. So he's basically stating that in less than 15 years, our intellectual and intelligent capabilities will be surpassed by computers. And Hawkins is saying, when that happens, we're doomed. So I bring forth <clears throat> Sir Roger Penrose, a mathematical physicist. And he and Stuart Hameroff, a medical doctor, anesthesiologist, have rocked the neuroscience field and have now started rocking even quantum physics itself. So early on, Penrose wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind. And in there, Penrose hypothesizes that quantum mechanics plays an essential role in the understanding of human consciousness. The collapse of the quantum wave function is seen as playing an important role in brain function. <clears throat> Just a little explanation of what that means. So what Penrose is basically saying is neuroscience is not really taking into account quantum mechanics, especially from the point of view of human consciousness. Because of the research that has been done by Penrose and Hameroff, they are showing there is a direct link between human consciousness and the collapse of what's called a quantum wave function. Now, in ordinary terms, we think this is reality. Everything in the room has mass, has hardness, touchable, and consequently, we think it's real. However, what they have shown in quantum labs is that this is just not necessarily the case. And I will give a demonstration of that in a bit. So <clears throat> what they have discovered is that this exists because we all agree it exists. And if we all agree to bring in another quantum potential with consciousness, this can disexist. In fact, they have shown that if consciousness collectively chooses to ignore matter, matter fades away. In other words, if the entire planet Earth decided they were going to ignore the moon, in short order, the moon would fade away. So reality is based on consciousness and its ability to collapse what's called the wave potential. <clears throat> so in a mathematical terms, the wave potential is the statistical probability that quantum particles will show up in a given space and time. And so what Penrose is doing is showing that human consciousness plays a vital role, a vital role in governing what we call reality. So Penrose argues twofold. 
First, he shows why human intelligence could not be implemented by any artificial intelligence. Using Turing machine equivalent computers, which is ordinary, parallel, neural, or otherwise. Um, I think I'll just skip by that. Then he shows how it could not be physically possible that the human mind can be algorithmic in this sense. Now what that sentence means is you cannot attach a formula to the way consciousness works. You, you cannot. He's saying as a physicist this is impossible. And if you cannot attach an algorithm to the way human consciousness works, which means the way the brain works, then there is no way that artificial intelligence is going to mimic our human brain and our consciousness. And I think he's right. So, in, quant in quantum mind or quantum consciousness, hy hypothesis proposes that classical mechanics cannot explain consciousness, while quantum mechanical phenomena such as quantum entanglement and superposition may play an important part in the brain's function and could form the basis of an explanation of consciousness. Let me illustrate, okay? So I'm going to need a couple of volunteers. Make, make Cena disappear for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to ignore him for a while. <laughs> That's all it takes. Okay. Somebody stole my glass. <laughs> no, it was another glass, an empty glass. Here, you can have this one. Right there. Okay, a couple of volunteers, if I may. Anybody? Okay, you and you. All right, let's stand right here where everyone can see us. Come on up. All right, so I want one of you to face the screen and the other to face the audience. Okay. Now, all I'm going to do is check to see where their bodies are with regards to action interaction on a conscious level. So I'm going to ask each one of you to raise one of your arms straight out in front of you. Straight out in front, like this. Okay. And I'm going to push down. I want you to hold that arm there. Ready? Hold. Okay. So you see how strong he is. And over here. <laughs> arm. Hold. Hold. Okay. All right, now watch this. Don't anybody say anything. <laughs> Hold. Hold. Okay, now turn around. Turn around. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to draw your attention to the glass. Okay. Now let's test you again. Arm up. Hold. Okay. Please stay here just for a minute. Glass. Back to normal. Arms up, please. Hold. Arm up. <laughs> Hold. Okay. Thank you. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. There is a way. This is what's called quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Humans are magnificent in their ability to move into oneness. All you have to do is use the highway of consciousness to do that. So you notice when I had one of the people not even able to see the glass, he was not affected by the quantum entanglement with the glass. <clears throat> the only thing I had to do was draw one of the guy's attention to the glass. In fact, if I tested everybody in the room, you would have reacted the same way as the guy who noticed the glass, simply by my drawing your consciousness to the glass. We have the ability to move into oneness not only with one another, but with anything. I could do this with a picture, I could do this with a chair, I could do this with a, with a fork and a spoon. As long as we take consciousness and move it into entanglement, we are one with anything we choose to bring in our consciousness in contact with. It is a miraculous ability that we have. And we are spending little research on this known fact. I'm not the only one who can do this. Any of you can do it. Scientists are aware of it. But because they call it spooky science, they're not doing any research on it. And I submit to you, they ought. 
and so does Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff.